YouTube, what's going on? Kevin the Tech Ninja here, and today we're talking about the Galaxy S20 FE. You know, I've been using it for about a week now as my daily phone, and now I feel confident enough to talk about it. So as always, I'm not going to dive into the specs too much, but I will put them on the screen for you to take a look at as I talk about certain features. This phone is called the FE, which stands for Fan Edition, which to me stands for budget version of the phone that happens to come out a few weeks before the iPhone 12 edition. In all actuality, it's a great phone. It's giving you the important specs, not all the bells and whistles and things that most people may not use, but things that can actually lower the price of the phone. So that all glass build that we've seen with the S20, it's now plastic, which isn't a big deal since this is a nice filling plastic and it doesn't get a ton of fingerprints. And also people toss phones into their cases anyways. Many changes like that were made and we'll walk through them as they come up in this review. The FE is a 6.5 inch displayed phone. Compared to the S20 Ultra, which is 6.9 inches, then the S20 Plus, which is 6.7, and then the S20, which is 6.2. It sits comfortably in the hand, enough screen real estate to consume media, play games, and do all that phone stuff. Now, speaking of the screen, it's an AMOLED display. It's 1080p resolution with that high refresh rate. It also has Gorilla Glass 3, which means it will crack easier if it's dropped compared to Gorilla Glass 6 which is on the premium S20 lineup. The bezels are also a bit thicker around the phone, but not enough to hinder the experience, but it is definitely noticeable. The phone is also $700 compared to the S20 lineup, which starts at $1,000. Kind of a side note here, there's some deals right now to knock $100 off this phone, bringing it down to $600. This reminds me when the iPhone 11 and the iPhone 11 Pro came out, there were some differences between the two phones, which made the price cheaper, but the things that were left out weren't things that really impacted the experience. And that just made the iPhone 11 a better phone for most people. I can easily say that the S20 FE is the better phone for most people too, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The features of the S20 FE that I find great are gonna be the 120 hertz display, the triple camera setup, and the 4500 milliamp battery. Together, they give you a great phone for a even better price. The phone doesn't feel cheap at all. If you told me it's a thousand dollar phone without telling me the specs, I wouldn't disagree with you. I do feel this phone is geared for the casual phone user, not so much as the phone lover. Now, a couple things that will draw a lot of people's attention will be the six colors and the 32 megapixel selfie that will supposedly get you sharper looking self portraits. It comes with 128 gigabytes of storage and six gigabytes of RAM and performance is very snappy. So if you're a storage hungry person, you do have the option to expand it with the memory card up to one terabyte. It's using the current Snapdragon 865 chip, which flies through basic tasks on Android. So flipping between apps, loading up some intense apps, games, all those things that you want to do on a phone, this phone performs exceptionally well. Using the phone, the 120 Hertz display is one thing that jumps out to me. It's an OLED panel, so everything just looks great. And it looks like a classic flagship Samsung phone. Colors are great, brightness is there, but it's not as bright as outside as the flagship Samsung phones, but it's still very good. Let's talk about cameras. You know, this is one feature that is very important to many people as this might be the most important thing to them. I will say this camera system for the price is the most versatile camera out there giving you three lenses, 32 megapixels up front, and the crazy zooming features. The back of the camera are the following, 12 megapixel for ultra wide, 12 megapixel for main, and just the standard wide angle, and the eight megapixel telephoto lens, and the 3X optical zoom with 30X space zoom, which is digital. This camera to me feels like any other Galaxy with most shots. The color profile for Samsung is not super accurate, but it gives you Instagram ready images with that punchy sky colors and the shadows bumped up a bit to make things even prettier. The skin is somewhat smoothed over and in some cases lined up a little bit. 
I feel with this phone and other Samsung phones, it goes for the brightest image as possible, and sometimes it sacrifices a part of the image and washes it out. Overall, the color profile is still very good. Not accurate, but still produces great shots that you can share instantly. The ultra wide camera looks great and it's just fun to use, especially if you want to show off a whole landscape. The 30X zoom is 100% digital, so it's not going to be perfect and super crisp, but Samsung did a great job with it. You can easily use 30X without an issue. I do find that it works best with larger objects that are further out rather than zooming in on something smaller. And of course, you gotta have a well-lit area. As far as selfies, Samsung is using something called Tetra Binning, which combines four pixels into one to capture more light. All these buzzwords, whatever. I do find that the images are very crisp and detailed, but once again, over smoothing of the skin, even with skin retouching turned off. As annoying as it is, I can't deny that these selfies do look good, just doesn't look like me all the way. Video is on par with the S20 and Note for me personally. Sound is good, stabilization is pretty good on the default settings, and then you have super steady mode, which drops the resolution down to make things even more stable. I will say that the standard video mode has worked well in pretty much all conditions, even lower light. It's not perfect in lower light, of course, but for a cell phone camera in 2020, this is extremely good and I put it up there with the iPhone and also the big brother, the S20 Ultra. For battery life, it lasts a whole day without any issues, netting me around six hours of screen on time. And I think I could push it a little bit more if I want, but my usage, it's perfect. For what it's worth, it's actually better than the Note 20 Ultra. Now both phones were on T-Mobile between 5G, 4G in some locations and Wi-Fi for most of the day. If the battery gets low, you'll need to plug it in, obviously, but here's where it starts to differ. When you plug it in, you get a 15 watt charger versus the 25 watt charger that the S20 regular comes with. You can upgrade for $29 if you do need faster charging, but I did find the charging speeds to be a lot slower compared to the S20. Overall, this is Samsung's iPhone 11, giving you amazing features of the main phone for a much cheaper price. I think it's a welcomed addition to the crowded Samsung lineup. I would have no beef to see the S20 Ultra just go away and just bring us the FE, S20, and S20 Plus. The Ultra naming is just confusing. And now what I like to do at the end of my video is give you some perspective of, of the phone landscape the way I see it. This phone is lined up to take on the 8T from OnePlus and the iPhone 12, which may be called the iPhone mini, but we will see about that. This is gonna be an interesting October with phones that are being really good for low prices and expensive phones are really good too, but they are getting more and more expensive. It's getting to the point where I find the budget phones, quote unquote budget phones, are becoming much more appealing. And then of course you have the Pixel 5. It just got just announced actually about an hour ago for $700. And also you have the Pixel 4a 5G for $100 cheaper than that. Wow, October is stacked up to be an amazing month for cell phones. And as always, I will be here to cover it to the best of my ability. Anyways, guys, Kevin the Tech Ninja here. Hit subscribe and let's get it.